We good. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Talking Amongst Our Shelves. And I am Kate, and my friends Becky and Bethany uh, make up the the trio that do this live show. So we're just going to talk about some more of our Victober reads and the various um, <laughs> states that we are in at the end of, uh, of Victober. So maybe we could kind of alternate like we did before ladies. Um, and then if that doesn't go too long, we can touch on some different things we're looking forward to reading next month um, in November. So I guess I'll start us off. And I finished the um, Small House at Allington by Anthony Trollope. Um, so this was definitely good, but unfortunately it was just three stars kind of like the whole way throughout and so I think I was so like swept away by Dr. Thorne. I really enjoyed that. And then Family Parsonage was even better. Um, so it was just a slight come down, but I still definitely enjoyed it. I think though, sometimes with Trollope's books, just the way his writing style is, um, the characters feel somewhat aloof and I can't, I can't ever put my finger on it. Like I can't figure out like, why do they feel distant to me. I don't know what it is. And so there were two like sisters in this one, but I just didn't feel that much of like a connection to them. So it was, it was very amusing like Trollope. Um, and his writing is just really pristine. Uh, but I guess when I, I think it's just my expectation of what a Victorian novel will be. And a lot of them, I feel very like emotionally engaged um, so I think if I, if I, I think maybe if I just have a different expectation for Trollope, maybe like this is going to be amusing and, um, that's how I should enjoy them. So all in all, it was definitely good. I think it just paled a little bit in comparison to some other ones. Bethany, do you want to go next? Sure. I'll just, you know, I was talking to. Kate and Becky a little bit about Desperate Remedies by Thomas Hardy, which I read earlier this month. And uh, just first Hardy, this is my first Thomas Hardy that I've ever read. So it's really interesting um, kind of getting a taste of how his writing is as compared to like Dickens and Gaskell and Trollope and seeing, okay, you know, he's different, but what does he do? that is going to engage me. This was probably just a three-star um, rating for me just because I thought, I don't know if I loved it, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Like the writing was good. I think Thomas Hardy does a lot of things well, but I thought this, the suspense was kind of like everywhere through this book. The plot kind of zigzagged around to different characters and you're trying to figure out who the villain is and like, what did they do or what are they going to do? And <laughs> who's in danger here? Because you kind of have this underlying like um, sense throughout the whole novel that there's something underhand going on or there's some plot against, I don't know, how, how do you say her name? Cytheria? Cytheria? Cytheria. Yeah. Like, I only Ooh. know that because of Libby Stevenson's video. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, I was going to, like, Google it and find out the pronunciation of her name, but, like, I'm like, I don't yes. know. Someone will know. <laughs> like, someone yeah, will know yeah. the name. But, like, you are you want to root for her, but at the same time, you know, she's, like, trying to find her way in the world. She's trying to, you know, be a companion or a lady's maid or whatever because she's in reduced circumstances. And, you know, she's pretty, so it's like everybody's after her, which I was talking to my husband about this. Like, what is it with these guys who barely know these pretty young girls in these Victorian novels? And they're like, oh, I just must, I must marry her. I have to, <laughs> like, I'm desperately in love with her all of a sudden. I'm like, they've barely spent two minutes together in the same room. And there were other people and she may have smiled or something, but like, where are you getting this? I'm desperately in love with this person from. I don't know, but it was just like, bless you. yeah, bless you, Kate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it was. I guess insta love is like even in uh, people talk about it in YA literature, mm -hmm. but I think it's in Victorian literature also. It was just interesting to me because I'm like, okay, you know, there's this penniless, beautiful female who's young and kind of helpless in a way because of, you know, her money situation and society. And then you've got this guy who is 
he's got it made. He's got money. He's got a home. He's got a housekeeper to take care of everything for him. What does he need a woman for? Like, why does he have this burning desire to get married? And it's like, like, what? Yeah, like, what is, what is the draw? Just that she's, like, I guess it's like a lust thing. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, yeah. it That's was interesting. interesting. If it is a lust thing, because like, it couldn't be touched upon that much then in a Victorian right. novel. Right, because it said, it, I mean, it talked a little bit on, you know, he, you know, men in the Victorian era, it wasn't uncommon for them to have, like, mistresses or to have prostitutes or whatever. And so, you know, for them, what was the draw to get a wife? Why would they want to find a wife? Was it a status symbol or to, you know, increase their income or whatever, or just to have like kind of a trophy wife in a way? That's what it seemed like with her and yeah. um, her Miss Aldcliffe, the lady who she was a companion to was really pushing this, which was a whole nother mystery. <laughs> inside of the book like oh, well why is she pushing her on this guy and what is the draw for that so it was just interesting I yeah I would give it three stars because it was a good read but it was also a little like explosive at the end like what is happening right now the villain is like not necessarily who I would have expected and not how I would have expected but I think I've rambled on long enough Becky please go ahead and take oh. <laughs> Take okay. away the camera from me. No, I was <laughs> I was trying to remember where the kind of split or break point with our last live stream was. I was like, oh yeah, what have I read in the last two weeks? But I know I read Kidnapped. Um, and this was kind of like right book, right time for me. Um, so for those of you that uh, maybe didn't catch the last live stream. I was in Scotland about a month ago. And because Robert Louis Stevenson is a Scottish author, um, I knew that one of my souvenirs from Scotland, I wanted to be a Robert Louis Stevenson book. Um, and I'd read Treasure Island and I'd read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but I'd never read Kidnapped. So I pick up Kidnapped. Kidnapped is set in Scotland, which I didn't realize when I bought it because I went in London. I didn't know anything about it, um, which was great because having been in Scotland a month ago, it was like, the perfect time where I could be like, oh yeah, it's talking about the islands and this is just the greatest thing ever. And there was like one scene where David, the protagonist, talks about walking up this hill and then before him he sees all of Edinburgh and the ocean and I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've stood on that hill. It's a pretty big like tourist attraction. Um, so that was really fun. And I read this um, after the let. And Villette was more introspective um, and more emotional. And this was very plot driven. Okay. So for me, it was like really nice that I could have a very plot driven book after a more contemplative, emotional book. Um, again, it was just kind of right book, right time. It was originally written for teenage boys and it shows. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't necessarily think it's that's a bad thing like again treasure island is you know sort of this adventure story and and whatnot and kidnapped you know i feel is um was the same way so um it was a lot of fun um and i can i can see why it was a classic but and, and, it, and it was way more enjoyable to read after having been in scotland i do not think i would have enjoyed it as much um if i read it like a year ago Sure, it was like the right time so, for it. Yeah, yeah. I right. see my um, the book I read after Desperate Remedies. I believe it was after, either after or before. Um, Love and Mr. Lewisham by H. G. Wells. I feel like mm -hmm. that could have been a great book. I know we were talking about it earlier. If I maybe read it a different time, I don't know if my lack of engagement with the characters and the plot were just like because it was just like okay I'm I'm not in the mood for this or mm -hmm. if it was from the book itself if I just wasn't into it I haven't actually read anything at least I don't think I've read anything by H.G. Wells so far pretty sure I okay. haven't so, so that goes into the next yeah. singer because <laughs> I have so read H.G. Wells so now you have to talk H.G. Wells up since I was like uh, I didn't enjoy it <laughs> exactly so this is uh 
kind of a twofer. It's uh, the War of the Worlds and the Time Machine. Um, the I read the Time Machine first because it was short, and I thought I'd feel more accomplished if I read the short <laughs> one first. I'd be like, there we go. <laughs> We've all done it, Becky. We've all done it. Um, so anyway, so I read the Time Machine. Um, oh, also confession, I had watched The Wishbone as a child, so I sort of knew the plot. Sure. Um, ish. I knew nothing about War of the Worlds except it involved Martians, which you learn in like the first page. Um, but anyway, um, the time machine, I could see, I d- it was like two and a half star read for me. Like, I thought it was well done. I could totally see why H.G. Wells is like the father of modern science fiction. And I think it was so far ahead of its time. And I think what he was trying to do, he did well. Uh, I just didn't particularly enjoy what he was trying to do. (laughs) Gotcha. So, um, but I was glad that I read it and I have no regrets of reading it. And then I went straight from reading The Time Machine into reading upside down because I got a nice like flippy copy. I love that. Um, That's cool. And I went straight into reading War of the Worlds. And again, this one I went into blind. I've never watched a film adaptation. I've never listened to the infamous radio drama. All I knew is my husband had wanted to uh, own a copy of it. And he was like, you'll really like it. And I did really enjoy it. And I have to say it was mind blowing simply because HG Wells wrote it. And I think I think it was serialized in 1897 and then published as a whole book in 1898. So depending on how you go by publication date, but end of the century. And it reads like something that was written after World War One or even World War Two. Like so many things that he comes up with, with the War of the Worlds and just so many things. I was like, if I did not know better, I would think that these were analogies for the world wars but they can't be because they were written before them um and like the time machine there was some kind of socioeconomic commentary um but it was done in such a way where i could still even i could enjoy i could enjoy that and appreciate but even as just a plot and a story i really i really enjoyed it the time machine i felt it became a little bit harder to enjoy the story um as just a story, and and I'm someone who actually does enjoy a lot of symbolism and so and social economic commentary, so it, it doesn't bother me. Um, but I just thought War of the Worlds kind of stands the test of time because those commentaries were veiled a little bit more. Um, and again, it just felt so far ahead of its time. Some things even still felt relevant. Where I'd read this, and I was I just kept telling John like, "This was written in 1897. What?" And I think half of the reason I enjoyed it was because I was just sitting there like, how did he come up with this in 1897? <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, really, really enjoyed it. Um, and science fiction is always a genre I think I won't enjoy. And then I pick it up and I end up really liking it. So I really need to give science fiction more of a fair shot because other than Star Wars so far, sorry, rest of the internet, there really isn't a whole lot of science fiction that I haven't enjoyed. I like Empire Strikes Back. I will, I will, give, I will give them that. I'm not a total Star Wars That's fan. That's my favorite one, too. The best one. Anyway, so that's me going all about, that's our H.G. Wells little, yeah. little segment. So, yeah, so Time Machine was kind of at War of the Worlds was like, yeah, I really like this. Good to know. So, and it didn't feel very Victorian. Yeah. Again, it was just, it was, it was really mind blowing. I almost felt like I was cheating. <laughs> they, um, they made a movie out of the time machine too, didn't they? They probably did. I don't know. I feel. I was trying really hard to insulate myself from any of those things because I didn't want spoilers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand that. Yes. So sorry, it was like like, cut out. um, But I could see on the video as I was like trying to reconnect, you were talking about kidnapped, but I couldn't hear you. So how many stars did you give it? Uh, I think I gave it four because it was like 
right book, right time, and it was set in Scotland, and I was reading it a month after being in Scotland. So it was like, oh, the Highlands, and like parts of Edinburgh that I've been to. And I will say, Kate, um, I know you did not totally love Count of Monte Cristo. The At least when you started. Huh? <laughs> the what did you say? Yes. Um, I will say, this was written for teenage boys, and it shows. It's very plot heavy, which is what I wanted at the time. So I thought it was really great. But if you are not into action adventure plot driven boy stories, <laughs> this may not be the book for you. But if you're in the mood for that, you might like it. So the Count of Monte Cristo is one like a thousand pages. It's true. Yeah, this was like two hundred and ninety. <laughs> yeah, like I could totally deal with. I think I could be like down for that for that kind of length. Um, okay, I guess, yeah, I guess I'll go. Um, so I did also, I was able to finish, the light is really like a lot dimmer with a cell phone, but Dear Brooke. Um, and I really liked that. I really, really liked it. Uh, I just, there were a lot of really wild and crazy things that happen that would only happen in a Victorian novel because of Victorian society, um, uh, respectability is everything. And so then when that's kind of, when people call that into question, how it can kind of just like call, cause a crazy course of events to happen. And um, what I loved about that is that there were certain weaknesses in the characters prior to these, these times when, you know, hardships came and instead of the weaknesses being heightened after these hard times, the characters really like found strength. They didn't know that they had. And, um, we're just kind of like, all right, you know, we got to buckle up. It's good. And I just love seeing what they had and, it was just, it was so, it was so cool. And I loved the sister relationship in this. And I definitely stand by um, the Marianne and Eleanor Dashwood analogy, except I think I actually liked this dynamic a bit more. Um, I feel like you got a bit more in their heads, which with Jane Austen, you don't, I don't think you would feel necessarily you get as much in their head as you would in a Victorian novel because she's mm -hmm. more restrained than a lot of victorian authors so yeah all in all that's definitely a new favorite and that was definitely a highlight for me and i'm really happy that i picked it up well speaking of new favorites <gasps> do, 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 do. <laughs> let's just gush and gushing about elizabeth gaskell because i mean the brilliance the brilliance of this woman like i don't know how she handles so many characters makes you care about all of them and also has all of, like each character grow by being like thrust upon a situation where all these other characters are involved like it, they're really unlikely friendships like i mean margaret with um like bessie and nicholas higgins like i mean you just it's so cool it's just so cool to see the friendships that kind of um, bloom out of their her upheaval and you know just their daily life she's willing to say hi and like be friendly to them and come over and sort of invite herself over to their house and it's like I am just totally enthralled I love Gaskell I've read Wives and Daughters and then this one and her short stories and I'm just like she's brilliant she is she is really well able to handle a bunch of characters and make you really interested in them and like the human relationships that happen between all of these different characters and like you don't necessarily like them it's almost like a reverse pride and prejudice with uh margaret and john thornton it's kind of funny <laughs> because I'm like, whoa I'm getting, i did not oh, think it was like that until i read the book and the book yeah versus like the movie I mean, they did really great with the casting, but watching the movie adaptation or the miniseries ad adaptation right after reading this, I was like, wow, he's mean. 
they made Thornton really mean <laughs> compared to how he was in the book. It was crazy. He smiles. Yeah. Um, actually, it's funny that you should say that too about the miniseries because I did. I was like, I love the miniseries. I love it. But um, the first time I read North and South, I actually didn't really enjoy it. Really? And so I love the miniseries. Yeah, it was, it's really dense. Like, I think you underestimate your intelligence, Bethany. It's, <laughs> it's um, so I, um, then after I reread it this spring, then I tried to watch the miniseries again. And I was like, oh no, it's just, no, it's, <laughs> it's adequate. Um, yeah, it's it's really well done and everything, but when you think about it as an adaptation, that's when I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna. I, I was like thinking on the book. Mm hmm. A lot of the scenes in the book that um, were so made such an impact and were so like heavy with emotion and with like interest in the movie, they can't really show it, or they didn't show it, like. The scene where she like throws herself in front of him or hangs off of him in the movie. It's so quick and brief. Quick. Whereas you get all of this like um, built up emotion and all these views of it in her mind and in his mind and in other, you know, other characters perceptions of it. And it lasts so much longer. And so you get a lot more like how this was so impactful to both of them in different ways. Whereas in the movie, they kind of hash it out a little bit when, you know, they're in dialogue, but it's not the same. So it's a little bit like off putting, I guess. Cause you're like, Oh, well, no, that, that you need more. You can't just jump to this point without having all these emotions yet. <laughs> and it's like, Well, you know, that's the thing about books. They can get the characters, um, you know, their interior, you know, I don't know, what do you call that? The, like the mental narrative that's going on with this character, you get a peek of that. Whereas in the movie, they can kind of show you and let you draw your own conclusions, but you don't get exactly what the character's thinking like you would in the book. So, I don't know. I loved it, yeah. though. I think I read this in like three days. I was like, whoa, completely. Dang. It was so good. I just was Slept like, up. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it was hard. To, it was after like Love and Mr. Lucian and Desperate Remedies. And I was feeling a little like, oh, the, none of these characters, like, I don't really care about them enough. Like, I want to really like be invested with these characters. And I feel like eh, mm -hmm. I could take them or leave them. And then, you know, Elizabeth Gaskell shows up with, you know, all engines running. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I like that character. I'm that character and I care about all of them. I was crying through parts of this book. And I was like, I, I mean, there's a lot of death in it, which always, like, gets me, like, emotional. Like, her parents both die. Um, ooh, I shouldn't say that if it's a spoiler. Whoops. <laughs> like, I'm just going in full in. Sorry to all of our viewers <laughs> if I spoiled anything. But there's a lot of emotional trial. In this. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's really good. I'm What? I just remember thinking, like, could her life get any harder? I don't know if it could. It was crazy. <laughs> well, now I, I feel like I need to. Um, the one thing, though, that I really did like, because they made it really dramatic and, like, lengthened it out. The first time that Marvel, and then she comes back, and she's writing a letter to her cousin. What's her cousin's name? Um, Edith. 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 Mm -hmm. She's writing to Edith and she says, I've seen hell. I've seen hell and it's snow white. Do you remember that? Yes. I think that wasn't that in the adaptation or was it in the book too? Yeah, it was the adaptation. Okay. Um, so I did li like that. It was just such a like visceral way to put like sh how just how jarring this new like location is to her. Right. Um, so do you know at this point, can you tell whether North and South or Wives and Daughters you prefer? See, 
after reading North and South, now I'm on fire to read Wives and Daughters again for that reason, because I'm like, I gotta know which one's better, because I really, I've seen the miniseries, and I really enjoyed it, and then I read Wives and Daughters, um, I think it was a year or two ago, for the first time, and I was like, oh, yep, this is, like, following the miniseries, like, perfectly, like, <laughs> it felt like a companion to the miniseries, and I was like, um, there were some extra things, and then, of course, the ending was different because she hadn't completed the ending whereas in the miniseries they did kind of wrap it up a little more it wasn't that far of a stretch but still um so I I wasn't expecting that so I think that kind of threw me a little bit because I was like wait it's not there's no ending like it's not completely finished so I do want to read it again now that I know that and see if I still feel like a little disappointed by that or if I feel like fine because she I mean I just have such an appreciation for her ability to draw characters and to like put them in. I mean, even with wives and daughters, they're in such unlikely friendships in a lot of different ways. And people are thrown together that you wouldn't expect to be thrown together and learn to grow from each other in a really cool way. I think that's like one of my favorite things that Gaskell has done in her books that I've read so far. Just wanting to so, catch up on yeah, comments real quick. So... Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> We're like getting you have a couple. Um, Maria says, I have Dear Book. I've read spoilers that made me think I wouldn't like it. I'll give it a chance now. Smiley face. And mm-hmm. are you still reading? Are you still reading? Says, I feel that North and South gets a little draggy in the second half. I did like it, though. And Maria says, I've always loved North and South because it was my first Victorian novel. Oh, that's special. It has its slower parts, I'm, but it's I'm sorry. But still, it is amazing. It's really hard to hear. My internet's being really creepy. So I'm going to reset it and I'll, I'll just hop back on in just a minute after okay. I reset it. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Anyway, well, you can go back to right. gushing. I was just like, well, people are interacting. I don't want oh, to no. I, I was like, oh, I need to check the comments. I feel so bad. All our viewers, I feel like we're so rude to them. Hello, all our wonderful, beautiful viewers. We are so happy you're here. <laughs> and four of you know that. <laughs> Actually, I think one of those four is me because I've got a video pulled up in the back. <laughs> well, we have at least three. No, maybe two. Maybe it's just two. Hello to our two beautiful viewers that are watching and commenting because I have it pulled up too. <laughs> but I will say, I think a lot of Kate's uh, booktube followers are in other time zones. Yeah. Which, which that was amazing too. Her um, and Ange and Katie all pulling it together. And I set my alarm and woke up early and like had headphones next to my bed so I could like wake up and watch it. I missed the first part of it, but it was left up online. So I got to catch up on it later, but it was really cool. I just thought that was so amazing. They were all in different time zones and trying to coordinate so that they all, could all get on. All on different continents, not just time zones, but continents. It's impressive. It's really cool. Yeah. It like, oh, this is so great that people across the world can be talking about Victorian literature. It made my heart happy. That's what, I mean, like, like I was telling you before we went live, like, that's just, like, one of my favorite things about BookTube. It's so cool, the the community and the aspect that people are here to listen to each other talk about literature. And it's just so cool, like, hey, we all just want to, like, chat and listen to each other's thoughts about it. I love that. I think yeah. it's a positive thing, you know, and so it, it unites people that, they would never talk ever. Like they're in different continents. They wouldn't know the other person exists. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's really awesome. Yeah, I that agree. It was Are so you... early, but it was so neat. Yeah. It was I... really cool. It was so neat. It was awesome. really great. I love all three of their videos, their posts and stuff. So yeah. great. I have like special love for Katie because she loves our mutual friend. And like, that's how I found her channel. It's just like, oh, yay. She loves Dickens too. And then Ange, her her classic collection is just amazing. It's amazing. I love it. I love it when she talks classics and she goes through all the Victorian classics she's read so far. And it's like, I didn't even know that one <laughs> existed. I actually <laughs> I know. It's awesome. It's really cool. I, I mean, these are all young, young women. Yeah. And I know Lucy wasn't awesome. on the live show, but she's, I think she's, I, she just had a birthday. I think I thought 19, she's like I think 19 she or something. 
Oh um, my goodness. So she um, wasn't able to do the live show. The live show. I'm really bad. This is the dangerous thing about going live. I am notorious for mixing up my words. I apologize to you. you, you blah, 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 blah. They will love you anyway because you're amazing and brilliant. <laughs> this, is, this is me. I trip up on my words all the time. My husband jokes I need a translator because it's really bad. That is, um, yeah, that is the beautiful thing about being live. It's authentic. What can you do? It's true. It's true. It's true. And we just this talk is... to the third and keep pushing through. So, so yeah. Becky, what about, what was the last one you were talking about that you had recently, most recently finished? Oh, yes. So um, I did a few audiobooks, which I was not expecting to do during October, but um, children's books are easy to listen to. So I did some children's books. I did um, The Warden and Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope. I do think um, when I get to Dr. Thorne, I will probably try to read that one. Um, but then... I, I had messaged uh, Bethany and Kate and said, hey, I don't have a whole lot of time. I'm finding that I'm doing more audiobooks than I am physical books. I need some more, like, easier to listen to Victorian novels. And Kate had recommended Three Men in a Boat. And while the title sounds mundane, the book is anything but. I've listened to the audiobook. The narrator was fantastic. And within the first 20 minutes, I think I laughed out loud like seven times. I was driving home and I was just like, ah, ha, 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 in my car. And like, I came home and I was like, honey, I'm only 20 minutes in this book for you. I have to read it. It's hilarious. And I found out that there's a sequel. Yes. Um, so I, I'm only like five or 10 minutes into it because I, I found it through my library yesterday and downloaded it while I was like washing dishes or something. Um, but that one's a bike trip. And it still counts for October because even though the sequel was written like 11 years after Three Men in a Boat, uh, it, was, it was like published in like 1900. So it just like... There you go. Barely squeezes its way in there. So anyway, it it was like hearted. It was witty. It, I could, even though there is sort of a overarching story, there are still a lot of vignettes that in some ways actually remind me of modern stand-up comedy. Mm. Um where you're kind of like telling a story, but it's a funny little anecdote or vignette or something. And then you kind of like go on with your whole theme. So it's like, oh, so this is like a Victorian stand-up comedy. And I was trying to picture it being read like in a parlor or something. Um, yeah. Or whatever. Anyway, I really, I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm, I, I won't even be disappointed if the sequel is like half as, maybe not half as good. Like two thirds or three quarters as good as mm -hmm. the original. I think I, I gave really read it now. Huh? I said you're making me really want to read this now. Like let's mm -hmm. we're just gonna go November, Victober. It's so funny. It was pretty short. The audiobook was only like six hours. Oh wow. Yeah. And I tend yeah. to speed up audiobooks a little bit, so I think I got through it in a total of four or five hours. So I can't imagine it's it's gotta be under three hundred pages. Yeah, I think you're right. The joke in it that I like, <laughs> it still makes me laugh now, is when he's talking about how George works at the bank and it says, George went to go sleep at a bank every day. <laughs> I like the part where they're, it's, it's pretty early on in the book where they're talking about like hanging a painting or like <laughs> hanging a picture and they're just trying to like, okay, you have to get the hammer and you have to get the nails and you have to bring, no, Susie, like move it over here and the whole description, I just want And the dad, it. the dad always walks in and he's like, no, oh, I'll hang it myself, I'll hang it myself and then he ends yeah. up having like 10 helpers. Yeah, it was, it was great. And it's, it's hard to describe too because the setup and the delivery is so great. Again, in a way that sort of like mo modern stand-up comedy that to tell you, oh my gosh, the funniest part was someone talking about hanging up a painting sounds really boring. And to say yes. three men in a boat sounds really boring. <laughs> but he makes it Delivery not boring. It's everything. Yeah. So is that yeah. a new favorite for you then, Becky? I think so. I, it might be one that I have to own a copy of because it was uh, it was delightful. I just really enjoyed it. And again, maybe it was just one of those things that it was like right book right time i don't know victorian stand-up oh well sounds great i mean i'm not <laughs> saying it was in it, but that's kind of like what it felt to me 
So funny. I was like, man, this is like a great stand up comedy routine. Like, wear a cravat or something and just read the book. It would be hilarious. It's, yeah. I like, I can't, I can't not smile whenever I think about it. Yeah. So, yeah. Ugh. It was, it was really great. So, that was a very pleasant surprise. So, thank you for the recommendation, Kate. And I'm very excited to see how three men on the bubble, bubble. I think it's called. Bumble, yeah. something like that. Yeah, so they go on a bike trip, and I'm. That just oh, sounds. Funny. <laughs> oh, and it's funny too to picture like the big Victorian bikes with like the one small wheel at the front. They're like classic. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then the two big ones on the back. I remember because I read um this Victorian Life, which was the memoir about the white mm-hmm. woman. Yeah, yeah. I saw a documentary about them or an interview with them or something. Oh yeah, yeah, and um she she and he loved to bike and so it was interesting to hear just that how they got a hold of these victorian bikes yeah i mean i Um, bet you if you went to some estate sale in the midwest someone probably has something in their barn because they that's that's yeah they went to estate sales um it was interesting so my elizabeth gaskell highlight was mary barton i really liked this i went in blind and i didn't know what to think because i knew it was like a lot to do with industrialization just like um north and south and i knew it was in manchester which is was home turf for elizabeth gaskell so Mm -hmm. i thought that's cool Mm -hmm. um and i knew there was a mermaid in it so (laughs) that's cool mermaid i so i was like all right i don't really know what this book is going to be like. Um, But I loved it. I loved it so much. I just, I loved it so much. And it was, it was such a fun group to read with because it was Kate from the novel Nomad, Katie from Life Between Words, Mm -hmm. Doris from Aldi Books, which she got, Mm -hmm. you know, you know how it is when you're like juggling different reads. She got a little behind. So I think she's planning on, on finishing it soon. And then Adam from Memento Mori, and so Adam reads like two hardy a year max. Um, and Katie from Life Between Words like read a lot of Victorian literature in college, but now is like super busy with work and two little boys. Uh-huh. So doesn't read as much, but really likes it. And then Kate from the novel Nomad reads a fair amount. Um, so it was just so cool hearing the whole like different ranges of experience. Um and like Adam, you know, I've talked up Elizabeth Gaskell so much. So he's like, I'm really curious to know, like you talk her up so much. Um, and what was really neat is at the end, he it wasn't like his favorite book, but it definitely spurred him on. And he said he was going to read more Gaskell after that. Yay. Um, yeah. You yeah. converted so someone. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. It, it was really cool because he... Um, he uh, it was so funny he said so we're getting basically the first six chapters are just like here's how poor these people are and uh what did he say he said all right well in these first six chapters we got our victorian poverty porn (laughs) i was like they do like that don't they um so the one uh trope as as i'll call it and i didn't know This was a thing that bothered me so much until like it was in this. And I'm like, this is in a fair amount of Victorian novels. And I talked about it to Ange and Katie in their live show, but that um, this one really stressful thing happens and it could all be fixed if two people would just sit down and have a conversation together. But, but they're not going to, because that's not what you do. It's either like it's somebody from a different class or it's a man and a woman and they can't have this kind of conversation. (laughs) It's such a like face palm thing. But if I'm still able to enjoy it a lot, despite that, that like, you know, speaks highly of the book to me. So yeah, I, and it actually surpassed Sylvia's Lovers for me. Oh, Um, Yes. And Sylvia's Lovers was like, I didn't think it was going to be, I didn't think it was going to be outranked out of third place. So our third place. <laughs> Are you still reading says a mermaid? I'm curious, which is exactly what I was thinking, as, especially because I know I know Manchester was an industrial city. Yeah. So it the two pieces don't fit together in my mind, but I'm very interested now. I know. Yeah, 
I don't know if you guys watch Gilmore Girls at all, but sometimes they'll be like keywords for the story that I'll tell you later. So it would be like Manchester, mermaid, poor people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, Bye, tangent, because I want to know if anyone else has this nerdy issue. Okay. But I have a currency converter app on my phone, which also has like an inflation calculator. <laughs> So whenever I'm watching something set in the United States in like the 50s and they're like, oh my goodness, this is $2, I whip out my phone and I calculate it and I'm like, okay, that's how much this would be in today's money. Or if someone wins $1,000, I'll be like, okay, that's why this is significant. It's very hard to read Victorian literature because mm -hmm. not only do I not understand shillings and guineas and all that stuff, I have no clue what the exchange rate was. <laughs> Yes. During the previous point of Queen Victoria's reign. So I just sit there and I'm like, I don't know if three shillings converted to United States dollars adjusted for inflation for 2018 would feel like a lot or not. Yeah, it really bugs me. No, I've actually, I have felt your pain. And in Deerbrook, they were given a hundred pounds and super excited about it. And I'm like, a hundred pounds. How much is that? Is that like a thousand dollars? Is it like $10,000? I know. Well, and at first, like, I know what the current exchange rate is roughly, again, because I'm a nerd for, you know, pounds and U.S. dollars. But I was reading um, or listening to Little Lord Fauntleroy, and there's a scene where someone give uh, an Englishman gives an American five pounds. They're like, oh, this is like $25. And I was like, well, that's nowhere near what the exchange rate is nowadays. Yeah. Like, oh. That was way more. So I'm like, oh, the, it was the, I don't know. So, mm -hmm. and I don't even know if that was accurate or if the character was just like ignorant and pulling a number out of their hat because they didn't know any better. But yeah, I, uh, I, I need a full book on like every decade and how that would translate to U.S. dollars so that you I, need I can to convert it to... Okay, Becky, didn't you tell me a while back that your brother was working on an app for the laundry room? In yes. Life? Okay. He needs to make a Victorian literature currency converter app. Yes. That'd be so helpful. <laughs> or even you will not just <laughs> Victorian. You look at me like I have two heads, but I can bring it up over Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> be like, my friends want you to do this. Yes. And don't stop there. Regency would be nice too. Like, okay, let's let's talk about how much Darcy was really Just worth. How much because... is ten thousand pounds a year? Yeah. And then if we want the expansion pack, we can get into like French and Russian novels. Oh yes. Well, and also what people don't talk about a lot, but a friend was telling me a few years ago, like in Sense and Sensibility, how Edward's family wants him to go into the church, and he's like being a vicar at that time was actually a pretty good gig. And he was saying like all the perks that they had. And it was a lot more than I thought. Um, and I guess also status in addition to an income that I thought was like more than I thought it would have been in, but it was also very like respectable. Yeah. Um, like if you could do like trade or the clergy, you know, you don't have much respect for doing like owning a shop or something. That's so interesting because in Dr. Thorne, they were talking about, like, uh, I think it was Patience and Mary were discussing, like, which is better, being a doctor or a clergyman? And it was just interesting, like, those two were compared. And nowadays, I feel like that couldn't be farther. Yeah. Like, wow, those are nowhere near in comparison, unless you're, like, Joel Osteen, maybe. <laughs> but I don't know, like, you know, <laughs> like, a, a famous oh, yeah. creature. But I think we're a far less religious society nowadays true true yeah um rose like you just went to church in victorian england right like, there's i don't know if you watch lark rise to candleford the show but it's like yeah yeah do you remember the atheist there's an atheist in an episode and it's like oh <gasps> right uh, yeah. <laughs> yes the scandal um yeah Maria says i'd buy that app yeah well someone can watch our video and make a million dollars <laughs> off of it you're and then we'll be able to convert yeah, yeah. it to what it would have been in the Victorian era. <laughs> Wait, a million dollars Victorian era dollars or a million No, dollars? like if we were to convert a million, we can do the reverse oh, too. Oh, so like a million dollars today, what would that have been in British pounds circa like 1860? Yes. 
It's a little more math than my brain wants to do. I want to hit a button and have someone tell me. <laughs> yeah, your mind, your brain's worrying enough with all the Victorian like literature you're reading. It's like, oh, this is like a lot to sort through, and then you're like, I don't have time for the money aspect. <laughs> Somebody help me out here. Um. So, Bethany, I'm sorry. My technology has been plotting against me tonight. Did you talk about Dr. Thorne already? No, not, I mean, I just now, but like, that's about it. I've, yeah. I've only read, I've read a little over half of it. So okay. I'm like loving it. It's really, Good. It's, I've watched the miniseries and liked it. So I knew, yeah, I knew it was a good chance, but I mean, he's like the first, I would say the first male Victorian author this month that I've read that I've really thought, oh yes, I'm, I'm interested in his characters. I mean, mm. this story and the, he has a lot of characters. I'm like, there's a lot of people on his plate and he's juggling them well. And he's not afraid to like talk to you as a reader and be like, Hey, bear with me. If I were a better author, if I were a younger author, I could do this better. But like, I got to explain it the way I got to explain it. <laughs> I adore that about him. That he's yeah, yeah. so fun a reader and is ironic and quippy about it. So funny. It. Um, John, um, my husband and I were talking actually a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about like twists in books. And um, he was reading Dance Macabre by Stephen King, which is actually a nonfiction book that kind of goes to the history of horror. But anyway, Stephen King had this whole segment of like, he didn't use the word anathema, but basically like anathema to the people that read the last few pages of a book and how like a good author will weave multiple things throughout the story. So even if you read the beginning and end, there's a whole lot in the middle that would still feel a surprise. Mm -hmm. And there was a part in um, Barchester Towers where Trollope was like, oh, you probably think that this will happen. Well, I'm going to save you the trouble of skipping to the end of the book and just tell you this ends this way. But bear with me as I try to tell the story and get you there. And so I was yes. like, you there we go. Yes. Yeah. It's like he, I, I, yeah, Dickens, bless his heart. And I'm really <laughs> enjoying David Copperfield. But he's just like, aren't I clever? Yeah, oh, clever. <laughs> so yeah, still really, I'm in. So I think we're all in the middle of something because mm -hmm. I am. Yes, I'm telling myself I'm gonna finish it. I have like 150 pages left of David Copperfield. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I don't know if I'll finish it, but I've been doing the audiobook very sped up and playing Panda Pop. Um, that's what that's the state that I am in at the end of October. Um. But I really like David Copperfield. Um, one more. Sorry, I just had one more thought on Anthony Trollope. And how I said it was like three stars. I think it's because when I read, he's not like one of my most, like, I don't feel as emotionally connected to his books. So he's not one of my like top, topest authors like Elizabeth Gaskell. Um, so, but when I read him, not during Victober. I was like, okay, I had a lot of fun with Framley Parsonage. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll try to read um, this, what is it? The last, the last one in that series that I can't remember the name of, not during Victober. I'll read it before Victober next year. And I, okay. I'll be curious. I think that's the, like, kind of the catch with Victober that's, that's tricky is you yes. want to read these really, like, big Victorian novels because it's Victober. But at the same time, like with Little Dora, I read it in September because I wanted to read it for Victober, but at the same time, I didn't want it to kill my Victober. If you know what I mean? Like there's, yes. there's so many different things you want to read, but you don't want to be like weighed down and you have to kind of like know your author and know like, yeah. okay, this one's one I'm going to have to take my time with. And you either have to make an allotment for that or you just have to be okay with not finishing it in time or whatever because otherwise it just yeah. kills the book. It kills the Victober mood. And yeah. you're just like, I, I didn't enjoy it as much as I probably would have if I would have read it when I'm a little more like, okay, I don't have a ton of other big heavy tomes on my, you know, plate. Yes. For this month. Yeah. So. And I think also, I think I was talking to Becky about this when she was visiting a couple weeks ago that... I've started now branching out to kind of the like lesser known ones. And I think, unfortunately, there's one of 
two possibilities with them or there's yeah there's two possibilities with them um and one is it's a hidden gem that we don't know why but for some reason it got forgotten or yeah there's a reason it's forgotten and the trail like, of the serpent the trail of the <laughs> trail of the serpent <laughs> so disappointed i was just watching um andrea's video from uh or andrea uh from infinite text and mm -hmm. i remember i had messaged you guys about the fate of Fenella, the one that's written by like 20 different yeah. authors <sighs> and she said it was like a giant mess oh, she yeah. said that none of the like the authors didn't talk to each other to know what the ending was gonna be and no <laughs> it was so slapdash so I was so so I'm like all right it's it was an experiment mm -hmm. it's a fun idea but I think it works for something more like um there's a tv show maybe Firefly was the one that had a different writer for each episode or something mm -hmm. but um but the writers talked to one another that so important like if we would yeah. just sit down and have a conversation all of this mess would have been avoided <laughs> Yes. Maybe so, you approach it instead as more of a historical document. Yes. That yep. might be more enlightening. I think so. I think so. Um, so, yeah, I think with those more obscure titles, I should just be more willing to DNF. Yeah. So, but what made it so heartbreaking about the Trail of the Serpent was that there were parts that I genuinely loved. Like the parts with the detective, I was like, this is so much fun. So I couldn't believe for how much I love those parts, how much I really dislike the parts with the villain. Mm. It was like- Which actually you saying that has actually increased my interest in reading it. Because you and I have pretty similar tastes, but once in a while there will be a wild card book that's like, I'll enjoy it more than you or vice versa. And even though yes. we have pretty similar tastes, there are one or there tend to be like a couple outliers. So part of me is like, Oh, Kate really likes parts of this. So I'm really, yeah. I actually kind of want to go, probably not anytime soon, but I actually would like to read it to yeah. see if I feel the same way or yes. if it's more of a, a person or if it's more of just like a taste or even expectation. Because I think I'd probably yeah. go into it differently yes. knowing your you opinion would. going um, into it. And if you're fine with 70% villain and 30% sleuth, Oh. Going in. <laughs> Becky's like, no, yeah, no dice. No dice. <laughs> can't do it. <laughs> but if you still want to read it, I will mail my copy to you because I will not be using it anytime soon. <laughs> wow. Well, I will take it. It can be my Christmas <laughs> present. <laughs> awesome. Um, yes. Yeah. So, Becky, uh, do you, you want to show what you're in the midst of? Yeah. So, <clears throat> these two ladies have been after me for a while to read. Lady Oddly Secrets. And I'd planned out my Victober TBR to hit nearly all the challenges. I didn't do a watch an adaptation because I try to watch things my husband will watch with me. I wasn't sure how that would go. But anyway, <laughs> um, he actually he actually probably would watch it if I asked him. I just didn't want to ask. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, Lady Oddly Secrets. So I did finish my main Victober TBR and snuck in a couple extra audiobooks I wasn't planning on doing. So, but because this was kind of my bonus book, like one that I wanted to get to, but I wasn't pressuring myself to get to it, I am taking my time with it. So I am probably two thirds or three quarters done. I can't remember if this bookmark is current because I was reading a little bit of it um, on my phone, um, but it does go pretty quickly. And I am enjoying it. But again, I, I want to take my time with it. And I had actually kind of planned out like how many pages I'd have to read to have it finished by the end of October. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, you know you what? Play that game. I'm not, I'm not going to do that because I have a busy life and it's not a competition. <laughs> no. Like, I, I don't have an assignment due. Or <laughs> class. I don't have... I don't know. The, the only person that is telling me I need to have this read by the end of October is me. And I can just tell me to change that expectation. So I'm just taking my time with it. Um, 
And I was thinking there was one more I was toying around with starting. Becca. But. Was it Becca? Or maybe not. Is that Victober? No, it's not. Daphne. No, no I think. It was I know you were wanting to read um, in the fall, possibly. Yes, I, I am planning on my hope is to read Rebecca in November. Ooh, I, I mean, Victor and I have the same name. Like, I really should have read this book a long time. <laughs> no, I, no. As I recall, it's Becky, not Rebecca. <laughs> we grew up as kids, and Becky was so adamant. Like, nope, she was not Rebecca. She was Becky, not Rebecca. It's true. And like people, like people that didn't know me, would call me Rebecca, and I wouldn't respond because I would literally forget that it was my name. Well, that's like <laughs> I still forget sometimes that that's my name. People just automatically calling me Katie. Um, oh yeah. I had another friend, Kate, and she said when she was a kid and people would say, she'd go, oh, there's no I in my name. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. Yes. I have a friend so named Katie and it's just Katie. It's not short for anything. And it's just Katie. Like that's her legal name. And it's like, nope, it's not Kate. And it's not Catherine. And it's not Kathleen. It's just Katie, you know? So it's yes. like, you, you know, people kind of tend to make assumptions about like what your name is. And yeah. it's like, nope. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Go with so what it's funny because a lot of people a lot of people think Becky is my given name. Oh yeah. And oh, that's so, so like, funny. They'll like see something that has my legal name on it and they'll be like What? Like <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Same person. It's really it's really so pretty funny. great to see people's confusion for a couple seconds and try to put the piece especially because people don't go a lot of people don't go by Becky anymore. Um I feel like it's an yeah. older nickname. Mm. A lot of girls go by like Becca. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. You no, know, a lot of people but I was kind of on the tail end, so so funny. Okay. I like it. Well Kate is a classic yeah. name. That name's never gonna go out of style. Kate is just also, a <laughs> I forget. I forget which book you got. Maybe it was. I don't remember if it was North and South or Doctor Thorne. But you guys were talking about names. Can I just say, it's very refreshing how common the names in this book are. <laughs> After reading like Belette and all these French names, it's like oh. there's a Lucy and a Helen. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, I forget if her name is. Uh, oh, Phoebe. I was going to say Priscilla, but it's Phoebe. It's like. And Robert. And I'm like, oh, like very traditional name. Not that there's anything wrong with, with other names. Sure. It just always kind of surprises me, like as traditional as the Victorians were, how creative they get with some of their names. Because I do kind of expect everyone to be a John and a Mary, and they aren't. Well, yeah. Also, though, it's interesting. You can look up like the most popular baby names of the time. Yeah. Some of them are really, um, really interesting. Like I think... I almost think like Constantine was one. Um, oh, yeah. oh. Some of them are like super out there. Yeah. Um, oh, also I should add for Bethany, um, if you read Mary Barton, there's a little nugget in there for people who have read Wives and Daughters. <gasps> oh, I'm excited. That's all. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a little nugget and it made me very happy. Um, so. Moving on to November. Oh, yeah. Um, November. Yeah, because we're so yes. over Victober now. No, I'm just kidding. Dude. <laughs> Victober's <laughs> over, guys. It's over now. It's time for November. Let's <laughs> well, No, it's because I read one week. I kept up with two chunky Victorian books and read four, four other ones. Wait. So wow. next Next month, I shouldn't see. I made the whole video about how to October, and I didn't take my own advice. So, so it's hard year. though when you love it so much. It's hard to resist. It's like candy, you know. You like it, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. <laughs> it's it just is. like it <laughs> is. But that's October what this year donuts. is. I'm doing the like five star TBR thing, and I'm gonna read like I'm gonna try for two a month, two Victorian books a month, and that way it'll kind of maybe. I'm like, I should have a maximum of 10 on my TBR. Like 10 novels, 10 Victorian novels in a month would be ridiculous. But I put like 17. Becky. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had short ones, okay? The time machine was like 97 pages. 
<laughs> I felt like I was cheating. So I was, many of my books were under 300 pages. I was not throwing shade. Don't worry. Um, so, okay. Well, I'm very excited about nonfiction November. I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, so I have. I'm cousin Laura and once a college professor called out. Maria Alvarez. Alvarez. Yeah, that actually happened to me one time too. There was someone calling for Rebecca and I didn't answer. Oh, so we should be calling for Laura. Sorry, Laura. (laughs) That happened. Oh, Laura. I go by my middle name as well. My name is Molly Kate and I go by Kate. Oh, that's such a booktube name. (laughs) (laughs) And you know what? So, okay. I wish, I wish, I'm sorry, everyone, that we keep doing tangents. So if you stick with us this long. You are amazing. You're amazing. You're the real MVP. (laughs) (laughs) Um, When I was a kid, for some reason, I hated the name Molly. And I don't know why. I just did. I think I knew a fair number of people who named their dogs Molly. Mm. And so that, like, really bothered me. It was like a puppy name. Um, but now I love it. And I'm like, I wish when I went to college, I had just been like Molly or Molly Kate, like I, that would have been like such a clean break of it. You know, like I go to college and this is what people call me there. Right. And then I got married while I was in college. So then I was like, Molly, Kate, Van S. How, like, what am I? Who am I? <laughs> so it was just too confusing with the name. So I should have just gone by Molly. Anyhow. So Molly's still my first name. Oh, um, Wow. Yeah, that's because, cool. I yeah. I remember that because I I met Kate in college, and our RA had put our names outside of our doors. <laughs> but introducing ourselves, we didn't introduce ourselves by our real names. So people were like, "Wait, isn't there supposed to be like a girl named Rebecca in your room? And isn't there supposed to be a Molly in your room?" And we're like, "Yeah, but we don't go by those names. <laughs> <laughs> those are not our names because we're those people." Yeah. Oh, that's okay. My daughter is the same way. People get so confused. So confused. she's Kara legally. Yeah. Well, no, legally she's Catherine. And I see. Catherine is like a family name. That was my mom's name. And ever since I was a little girl, I'm like, I'm naming my daughter Catherine. And then Aww. you're trying to think of like a nickname for her. Cause you know, like Katie, Kate, um, Kathy, my mom was Kathy. So like, mm-hmm. and Jake, didn't like cat my husband he didn't like cat as a nickname and like there's all these nicknames we kind of like went over like well do you want to use a nickname don't you want to use because my mom was like against it she's like i'm calling her Catherine. and so then we came up with kara which is like it's not really a nickname because it's of another name but so is kate or katie and even like i guess cat's more of a nickname but like i'm like if peggy can be short for margaret (laughs) kara can be short for Catherine. so it's, yes. Yeah, it's weird. People get confused, but I'm like, oh well, she can just choose what she wants to be called when she's old enough. And yeah, yes, that's the thing. Well, she yeah, she says is... she says her name. She's like, oh, my name's Catherine. My name's Catherine. She's Aww. two. She knows her legal name, and that's all I can ask. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so you can choose whatever you like. So. That's really cute. Well, I mean, in, in To Kill a Mockingbird, she's Jean Louise, that she goes by Scout. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, what what is a nickname really? Is it just and, a girl thing, too? Because, like, I don't know, like, many guys that have, no, like... like, if you really? think about, um... I was just thinking about the Wodehouse books. Like, Birdie and all his friends go by crazy nicknames. Buffy, that have nothing to do. Yeah. Puppy. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was almost like a high society thing in the 20s. And they kind of hinted that in the, um... Her Royal Spineness books. Mm, they do those feel very pg woodhouse yeah i mean they're they are more contemporary but they do have like sometimes they'll even even though i'm uh seven or eight books in the series i think maybe i'm only six mm-hmm. but they'll like introduce the character and be like who is that again and then they'll say their nickname i'm like oh yeah okay i don't know who you're talking about yeah <laughs> sorry um, that was a really long day no i started it i started i'm it. sorry I feel like, I feel like we were in a a class together. We would be like the people who like kept the discussion not moving along. (laughs) (laughs) We digress too much. (laughs) We digress. That's such a like bookish word. I love it. Um, So yeah, for nonfiction November, I'm particularly excited for an Elizabeth Gaskell. Um, And then actually I have it. This, I started, I picked it up at the library. It's called 
West with the Night. And I don't know if you guys follow Dickens and Docs on Bookstagram. I do. Okay. Obviously, she, Dickens. <laughs> I don't think she, um, like, posted a picture of this. I don't think. I saw it in her Insta stories. Um, but it's just supposed to be, like, so lyrically written like the first paragraph says how is it possible to bring order out of memory i should like to begin at the beginning patiently like a weaver at his loom i should like to say this is the place to start there can be no other um so yeah i think she just traveled a ton and just had a very interesting life so it's her autobiography yeah that's what it is um so yeah i'm also i'm just looking forward to like i said reading something different um and then I guess one other book that comes to mind uh I found on somebody's nonfiction November TBR she's French no she's not French oh, she said before where she's from but her name is uh I, I think it's like Aime like they would say in French mm -hmm. though anyhow um and it's very timely because it's called surviving and thriving with an invisible illness and so it's for people like f with um autoimmune stuff or just mm -hmm. like chronic chronic illness and it's just supposed to be really encouraging about you know kind of how to do the day-to-day -day when you're feeling um really like 50 percent or something you um, know send me that link because or the picture of the book or whatever because i have a friend who's got pots p p o t s oh and addison's oh my goodness i've heard about pots Mm -hmm. and Addison. I've heard about both of those. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually wondering about POTS for myself, but that's a, that's a discussion for another day. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, will, I will send the link. Because um, yeah, she I, might be really interested in that. Yeah, that yeah, and it's very it. short. Like the, I, um, both the audiobook and the ebook are available on Hoopla, and so I'm kind of like, ooh, which one do I want to do? But the audiobook is only like five and a half hours. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of tempting, and that could just be really nice. So yeah, I'm, I'm someone who likes variety. And so I am really enjoying just doing something different and then continuing on with my Cinderella project. I have a bunch of novels I'm excited about and some mysteries in there. So it's my November. Oh. Becky and I were talking earlier about um, nonfiction November and the the fact we were participating <laughs> is that terrible? Like, <laughs> we're like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do nonfiction November neither. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. and here's the thing. I, I don't, I like, I love history and I love biography. So really it, it's not that it would be hard for me or I wouldn't enjoy doing nonfiction books. I just feel like I was so focused on Victober. I didn't plan my TBR in enough advance to get excited about it. And I have to be excited about a nonfiction book to pick it up because I do find them. I just, I, I process them differently than I yep, do novels. Right so I, they are hard. They're, they're harder for me to read. Yeah. Um, they are, they're more challenging. So I really kind of have to psych myself up for them. And I didn't do that. Much. That's okay. And you know, what's funny is like how exactly everything you're saying is like, it was me like a couple years ago when I didn't really like think about nonfiction November. And so it's yeah. taken me like three years to like throughout the course of the year, I've been like having like a Hawkeye for like what might interest me. And so I totally, I, yeah, you have to be motivated and excited about a readathon. Like that's like the whole oh, yeah. point for it to be fun. So um, like we, and we've talked before sometimes about like being a mood reader or being a seasonal reader. And for me, I prefer nonfiction in January mm -hmm. because it's That's like, so interesting. it's like new year, fresh start, new year. I mean, I don't really do new year's resolutions, but for me, it's like a fresh start and November I'm starting to think about the holidays. So I, and I like, I'm really busy. So I just start reading more kids books yeah. <laughs> or mysteries. Like that's what I want towards the end of the year. And then after reading all that January comes around and I'm like, I'm going to I don't know, increase my mind and my knowledge by reading hard books in January. And then February rolls around and I'm like, okay, I was a smarty pants for 30 days, <laughs> 30, 31 days, and now I'm done. Do you remember in um, Emma how she makes yeah. a list of like, Bethany, titles? do you know what you're... Yes, I remember that, Kate. Emma, huh? it was hilarious. She had like the list of, what's 101 titles so she could... Yes outdo Jane Fairfax with all of her <laughs> bookish knowledge or whatever. Her, 
to improve her mind. She's going to learn Chinese. <laughs> so funny. Sorry, I was just reading a comment that I, it was from, I feel bad. Laura. Laura. Yeah, she's Argentinian. A lot of people are called Maria something. Oh, there we go. So no, I have to keep using it. Yes, Becky, sorry. Um, is it a predominantly Catholic, I think, it's, is it a predominantly Catholic country? Because I know a lot of uh, Roman Catholics will name children after a saint. Well, you know, um, it's funny. Um, and so Mother Mary is, a, I know, is a very common name in uh, Catholic cultures. Um, yeah. Anyway. So, Becky, what is the, what is the, do you have, like, specific titles you're planning on in November? Or what's the kind of wheelhouse? Yeah. Uh, I'm still, I'm still working on it. So Rebecca is very high on my list, but I also said that in July and didn't get to it. So we'll but see. But it's the perfect season now. I know. I know. I, it really, it really is high. Like I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to pick it up after Lady Oddly's secret. I'm hoping. I'm also getting my wisdom teeth out. So we'll see. Oh, if I'm yes. Able to Bless your are you heart. Are you getting under for that? Huh? Or are you getting put under like oral surgery or are they just pulling it and numbing you? Oh, no. I'm, 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 I'm asleep. I won't know anything. Yeah, I didn't get to be asleep. They're like, nope, you you're did. fine. You're like, this is really creepy. You're like cutting uh, into my gums. I was out. I was out. I didn't even remember counting down. Uh -uh. I don't know. Anyway. I, no, I've never been put under for anything ever. I've never even had like when I had. Children, no epidural, nothing. So I've never maybe, had like strong drugs. Maybe it's a God thing. Like maybe you would react poorly to them. I kind of wonder because my mother's yeah. side of the family, they always get nauseous and sick. So uh, yeah. And, and you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no and nausea. You, I, I have like, I, I'm not kidding. I know six people who did not know they would react adversely to an epidural until they got it. Oh. Uh, um, yeah. Like, yeah. It's not really something you could get a test run for either. Like, <laughs> come on over, like, <laughs> come on over and yeah. try it out, like hair dye or something. <laughs> Make sure yeah. you do a little test yeah. somewhere. Yes. Yeah. I actually didn't have an epidural either with either two. And I, I feel like, I don't know, I have kind of low blood pressure, so I don't know what it would have done. So I'm glad I didn't, didn't feel yeah. like I needed it. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Becky. I really no. want to know. No. <laughs> you want to read. No, it's fine. Um, so yeah, so Rebecca's pretty high on my TBR. Um, Kate in her live stream with Katie from Books and Things mm -hmm. and Ange had talked about um, Nellie Bly's book, uh, oh. 10 Days in the Madhouse. And you couldn't remember who had written it. And when, um, oh, the Pope is Argentinian. I knew that. I'm sorry. I'm not Roman oh, Catholic, right. so I forgot. But I forgot that too. But so. you're right. Yes, that makes sense. Shows my ignorance. But I was I was pretty sure they were, but I didn't I didn't want to assume. Right. Um, an Argentinian. But anyway, um, yeah. So um, I knew the name Nellie Bly because uh, after I don't know how long after, but after Around the World in 80 Days came out, um, she actually traveled around the world and she did it in 72 days. So yeah. she wrote as she was oh. an investigative journalist and like wrote oh. um, a, a book or an article or a few essays about her journeying, like the real journeying around the world in 80 days or under. And it's the same woman that did the um, 10 days in the madhouse or whatever it's called. Yeah. So I had really wanted to read that in November because I was like, ooh, that just kind of like coming off of October. That sounds really fun. Um, it doesn't look as though my library has a copy. They have a children's biography. And I'm like, I want the children's story. I want the nitty gritty. Like, give me the real thing. Oh. I bet the ebook would be like 99 cents. Yeah. So I need to see if the ebook is available um, and if it's inexpensive because I'm cheap and don't really want to spend like seven dollars on it but or I could do interlibrary loan so I need to see if I can find it mm -hmm. um but if I can that's one I would really like to read and then um I want to go back to reading Lynn Johnson's for better or for worse comic series oh they were like I newspapers yeah so I had read them as a kid um 
and I love them. And my husband has gradually purchased all but one of them for me. Like I get a couple for every birthday and every Christmas. So um, you just like find who used and like we slowly build the collection. And it's been at least a year or two since I've read a couple. And they're just like really cozy and they remind me of my childhood. So with the holidays coming up, I'm like, I just want to read some for better or for worse. And aren't we the same age as April? Um, April was about six months younger than me. Yeah. Ow. That's, yeah, so, I guess she was. So I remember like I started reading the series when I was 11 or 12. And I remember April had started middle school. And so April and I were kind of going through the same things at the same time. When was her and birthday? Let me tell you. Huh? When was April's birthday? Uh, April 90 or 91. <laughs> 91? See, yeah. she's my age. No. <laughs> yes. So, oh. yeah, I guess she's really my sister's age. I for. Yeah, yeah, she's my younger sister's age. Um, but in case you couldn't tell, uh, we my whole family read them to the point where we knew the characters' birthdays. That's well, yeah. Didn't you guys so... used to like, hey, what did April do today at the yeah, dinner like, like dinner time <laughs> conversation? Was like, did you see that Elizabeth is home from college? <laughs> We're really you invested. Like the of your family. We're really invested, but it's really great because I picked up the series when I was in like middle school. But it had been running for quite a long time. So I'd never read the early stuff. And now I'm actually closer to Ellie, the mom's age, when the series mm-hmm. started. Oh, wow. So I, like, followed it when I was April's age. And now kind of going back, reading Ellie's story, I feel like I identify more with the mom now in some ways. But then oh. I did, it's like a whole new way of rediscovering the series. It's this- really great. This is so cool you saying that because I remember um, I watched a talk from the lady who wrote My Life in Middlemarch, the like uh, woman Mm -hmm. who loved Middlemarch. I didn't read the book, but in the talk, she wrote about how when she first, uh, when she was young and in high school, she identified with Dorothea. Mm -hmm. And then as she got older, she identified with uh, Dr. Lydgate. And then as she got older, she identified with Kasabin. And so it was, she said it was like a totally different book for her throughout each age. That's awesome. Yeah. See, you know, some good, good uh, comics and literature, they are just never done giving to us. You know, no. this was a, this was a news, this was a Canadian newspaper comic strip. And I'm still <laughs> talking about it well over a decade later. Yes. That's oh, awesome. so fun. Yes. So anyway, I I, uh, I might have to give the Pattersons a little visit. Yes. So do you know what you're reading, Bethany? Yeah, well, I went, <laughs> I went online and like, as we're, you know, getting towards the end, I'm finishing uh, Dr. Thorne and now I'm like, okay, I'm going to go on to the library and reserve a bunch of books. So all my book reservations <laughs> are coming in now and I'm like going, picking them up and getting excited. But you I'm doing like, like, all the fluffy in. books. So, oh yay! All the boys I've loved before, or two all the boys I've loved before. Um, <gasps> yes, the I'm gonna probably movie? just fly through those. I haven't read them yet. Have you read them, Kate? I I I enjoyed the part I read of to all the boys I loved before, but I just got sidetracked. But I did. I loved the Netflix movie. I haven't seen them yet. The Netflix I haven't one. seen the Netflix oh, yet. Dude. I. I I blew through all three books. I devoured them. It was like a read it in a day and a half, two days kind of book. That's how <sighs> Ghosted was for me by um, Rosie Walsh. Yeah, read, I'm on the wait list for that around, one. I saw it going around um, Bookstagram and I was like, ooh, that looks interesting. Like um, Katie and Molly talked a little bit about it, you know, and I think they even interviewed the author for their podcast. And I was like, oh, that yeah. sounds really cool. And it was just like one of those, you, you're like, I can't put this down. Cause when I put it down, it's all I'm thinking about. I have to figure out what's going on or what's happening next. And you know, these, I want to, these more modern books are so fast. <laughs> like they're so they easy really to read are. compared to Victorian. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I've got that one. And then Lainey Taylor's, um, Muse, I've got like a horrible glare. Muse of Nightmare. Which is sequel to Strange the Dreamer? Yes. Okay. Which is funny because I had that one 
pitted against um, Queen of the Tearling, and I wasn't sure which one to read because I had heard a lot about both of them. And I was like, okay, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't know. I haven't been real into, like, YA fiction, so I was trying mm -hmm. to, like, dip my toes in a little more since the Lunar Chronicles. And I was like, you know, just kind of getting a feel for some books that are more recent, more modern, and um, I don't know, the YA, I don't want really, to, like, cut it off altogether as a genre because right. it has something to offer. And so... Everybody voted for Strange as a Dreamer, or most everybody voted for Strange, which I think worked out quite nicely, because I don't know if I would have liked Queen of the Tearling. It seemed really long and complicated. <laughs> I was like, oh. I don't know. Yeah. I may have to try it again, but Strange as a Dreamer was so new and different, and books that I'm like, I don't know, anything that's new and different, like, that I've never seen done before, I'm just like, oh, I love this. Like, Echo, um... I can't remember the name of the author right now, but it was a middle uh -oh. middle grade book. And just yeah. the way she, I think it was a female author. I, it was just done so well, like, and so different than anything. There was like music to go with the stories. Yes. It was Ooh. so cool. It was just like, and it was historical and really just like, a very cool book, especially for something that was like middle grade. I thought it had all, it was really deep to me. I thought, oh, this is yeah. really cool to like do this, um, you know, draw these three strings together. You know, you've got the music aspect, the historical aspect, and then this kind of like um, fantasy sort of aspect and just mm -hmm. kind of pull them all together. And I was like, that's brilliant. I love it. So yeah. anyway, Train to Dreamer and then Muse of Nightmares is the second book. So I'm like, I got to know what happens. And it just came out in October, I think, or maybe September. And then Rise of the Mystics is Ted Decker. And that's the third one that oh, I have on fun. my list. I've always enjoyed Ted Decker. He, I don't think if I hadn't read his books, I probably never would have got any thrillers read ever because I'm just like thriller most thrillers are just like I can't handle some of the the ways they cross their boundary to get you like really freaked out but Ted yes. Decker has always done a really good job where he's not like getting grotesque because I can't handle like the blood guts and gore stuff so yes he does it really well and he's got a lot of really cool fantasy the circle series I don't know if you've read but those are really fantastic I have not. I haven't read anything by him. I only remember watching the one with the spiders. The spiders. I watched. I watched. Uh, was it House? Maybe. Maybe it was, that was so made long in ago. It was in high school. You would probably like three, which was mm -hmm. like a psychological thriller, and it okay. was fascinating. I think Becky would like three too. Um, I always you recommended that, that one to me in high school, and I still haven't. <laughs> I recommend it to everybody because I'm just like, it was so fascinating. And it was like a thriller where you could read it and you could be thrilled, but you're not like, you don't feel like icky at the end of it or whatever. Like you're like shaky and like, Ugh, I feel like I just went through an experience or whatever, <laughs> which some people might like that feeling. I'm not knocking no, it. Oh, but I, I do often feel that way. I've kind of broken up with thrillers because of that. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I've had like too much junk food. Right. Uh, and I... I'm annoyed that it's such a thing that they use violence against women and sex as like two of the major plot yeah. devices. Yeah. And I don't like, I'm don't not like, like I'm not saying I don't, I won't read a book that has sex in it, right. but it's just that it's so, it's so done. It's like, Oh, no. here we are. Oh, Oh wow. Look at this. So oh. yeah, um, there's been a couple Ted Decker books like that. Um, Bone man's daughters and the bride collector I felt were a little too much on the along not sex but like along the lines of like targeting women and I think as a man reading that it's probably a different experience than as a woman reading it yes and it's interesting I haven't really thought about it a whole lot because I'm like why are there books like this and all the women are targeted and it's <laughs> freaking me out a little bit well, but and it's weird because women write them too like I've I know yeah that's read true some written by women mm -hmm. where it's happening I'm like what like why I don't understand yeah so I think I mean I guess if you write thrillers you like them so then you kind of it's hard to maybe get the other ones out of your head totally like when you're writing your own one sure 
That makes sense. And, you know, for some people, it's maybe they have a distance to it. I mean, you have to have a distance towards some things to be okay with it, whereas other people maybe don't like some horror novels and stuff. You know, if you like I have small children, so I wouldn't want to read something that involves small children because that would be a little too much for me. But yes. some people might be able to handle reading that better than I would handle reading that. So right. there's something out there for everybody. But yeah, you have to know where yeah. your own limits are. Yeah, there was one that came out last summer called Do Not Become Alarmed. That was about mm -hmm. parents who were went on an island. Like they were on a cruise and they went on an island and they lost their kids. Oh. Yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> Becky's like freaking out over here. She's like, ah. Because <laughs> I'm paying to keep children, so it would be even worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yes. I, I guess it's just a matter of like knowing, okay, you know, I'm I'm good with this type of thriller and then you can still enjoy the genre to a certain yeah. extent yeah 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 so thank you for the wow six people i we love you people that you, yes. you stick with us through all <laughs> our you tangents stick around for our tangents about names names and exchange rates <laughs> <laughs> and apps would be apps and would be apps and Yes. Everything, everything under the sun. Yes. Wow. So thank you for, for watching. And I think we have our November date planned, right? Um. Yes. I want to say it is November 17th, I believe. That rings a bell. And that sounds right to me. Let me pull it up. Yes. Is it Friday? Saturday? It is a Saturday. Saturday. Yep. Saturday. That's right. Then, yep. Saturday, okay. November 17th, unless something crazy happens, that is the plan. Yes. <laughs> um, and I think we're going to be talking mysteries. Does that sound right? I honestly don't remember if we decided on a topic a or not. <laughs> we can talk mysteries. Clearly, we can talk whatever. I mean, it, you know, our viewers should know that it's not going to be limited to mysteries. <laughs> so we yeah, can probably okay. talk about duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Like um, these people can just comment anything in our comments and we'll go down the road. Like we will go down no, that tangent. We'll Talk follow. to us about whatever <laughs> we are um, here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what it was. Because we were we're gonna do talk about like books we'd like to read at Christmas in December. Yeah. And, uh -huh. But we haven't talked about mysteries yet, like on this show, and we in love our, mysteries. Oh, so yeah. It is. I, and actually, like, I don't want to spoil them, but we've actually thrown out a few ideas, too, even for, like, topics for next year. Yes. To discuss yeah. as well. So we may need to appoint someone as secretary to keep all of our ideas <laughs> free. We do. And um, I totally lost my train of thought. So on that <laughs> note, <laughs> thank you, ladies. Yeah, thank, thank you to, to all our viewers and... Everybody yeah. who watched. Enjoy your last talked. two days of October after this. <laughs> we will. At least I will. <laughs> I will. Yes. I'll be plowing. I have no pressure at this point, so I know I will enjoy it. Yes. Yeah. Alrighty. Good night. Good night. Bye.